Good morning. Welcome to this special worship. Uh, this is the majority of the uh, mission team that uh, they'll, well, they'll tell you what they did and uh, you remember through your support, but I just want to welcome you uh, to worship today. Be, uh, I'm not going to do announcements at the end, but I'll do a couple now, which is a reminder that there are some slots for, uh, for uh, refreshments and other things for next week. We need some helpers to sign up. That clipboard is in the narthex. Be mindful and keep in prayer this week the call committee as they interview a candidate. Uh, also, the uh, congregation, the council, as they meet on Tuesday night as well. Some important uh, things happening there. The council will be reporting uh, back to you in a dialogue next Sunday. So plan on staying for that dialogue uh, next Sunday as an update from the council as well. Uh, the worship today is not going to be projected on the screen, but rather pictures of the mission trip will be. So you have the yellow fo worship folder that has the songs in it. Be mindful that if it has shepherd's light, that's the 1030 time. Uh, the students are going to go from here down to Grace Lutheran because there's a few that have strong Grace roots in membership. And so... Uh, we're going to do the worship down there as well at 1030. So be aware of the 9, nine o'clock and 1030 times for different parts of the, of the music. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to them. Good morning. We represent the 2013 mission team. Uh, unfortunately, as with many weekends, people are busy uh, and scheduling conflicts, so a number of us aren't here. But as Pastor Michael said, this is a majority of us. Um, we trust we'll represent their experience and their growth as we share in this worship. For our mission trip, we had a daily devotion journal and with a daily theme that led us deeper into God's love and grace. So we were challenged to reflect on scripture and also to um, answer some questions that were brought forward to us. Uh, we had four themes, and we will be sharing all those with you today and giving you some personal reflection on them. Let us pray. Gracious God, Jesus called his disciples not only to learn, but to follow his example of caring for others in need. We thank you for our mission trip and for all who supported us with prayer and financial aid. Now in our worship, may we celebrate your spirit that calls us to proclaim the good news of your love in our words and deeds and invites us to rejoice in your presence here today. Amen.
As we left First Lutheran on Friday, June 14th, we each had mixed feelings about the trip, and that included our adult sponsors. Our feelings ranged from nervous to excited, anxious to hopeful, but those feelings were soon numbed by the 11-hour van ride. Once we got to our first hotel, it was nice to sleep in a bed instead of on someone's shoulder. Saturday, we got up all excited to get going until we found out we had nine hours to go. Finally, a minor detour on some really curvy, narrow mountain roads, we made it to our second hotel. Sunday morning, after a good night's rest, we got up knowing our mission experience would soon begin, but that would not officially start until later in the afternoon. First, however, we set off to a very special place in God's creation, Glacier National Park. The views were truly spectacular. After lunch while at the park, one of the members of the group had an accident, which really hit us. It reminded us that even as we enjoy the beauty of God's creation, we too are broken and are not perfect. Life is not about what goes wrong or how awful things could have been. Life is about how we live with our brokenness and the imperfections of others. After our time at Glacier, we got back in the vans headed out for Blackfeet Reservation. Our feelings now were, ner were nervousness and excitement began to return as we reached our home for the next week. A reading from the Word of God. Jesus also told his parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax, tax collector. The Phar Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home, justified rather than the other. For all who exalted themselves will be humble, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. In this verse, two men are praying. The Pharisee knew he, was the better, knew he was better than the tax collector, a man others judged as being sinful. Tax collectors were seen as traitors, or at least sellouts as they collected money for the occupying Roman Empire. The tax collector knew he was broken. He was not perfect. The tax collector focused on God's grace and asked for forgiveness for his sins. The Pharisee, blinded by pride, did not see that he was, in reality, the more broken of the two. He thanked God that he was not like the tax collector, a real sinner. The real brokenness in our lives causes blindness, and we do not see how much we need God's forgiveness and God's grace. Please turn to your worship outline under the section, Broken. Consider the people of the world, of our community. Think of those with different skin colors, those who are not of Norwegian descent or those of different social backgrounds, those who are poor, those, those who are homeless. Think of all the broken people. Now in the space provided, answer this. What makes you better than they are? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
For most of us, this was our first mission trip experience, myself included, um, and we didn't really know what to expect when we arrived there. We had kind of been briefed on what we might see and what it might be like, but um, actually arriving there, it, it really painted a different picture. As we approached the small town up here at Heart Butte, which was only 700 people, we had to go down some winding mountain roads. Um, when we got to the top of some uh, hills, we could see this road etched in the hillside just going on and on. It seemed like forever with very few cars and not very many people. It seemed very remote. Um, here in Wisconsin, to look out for deer crossing our path and squirrels running out in front of the road, out there we had to watch out for cattle, wild horse packs, and the prairie dogs that constantly were running out on the middle of the road. So it was a very interesting scenery. If I try to paint it for you, um, it was very brown. There was a lot of um, dirt and hillside with sparse grass growing. Yet in the distance, we could see the beautiful mountains peeking out from the top. So they had a beautiful landscape to look at it from the um, town of Heart Butte. What I would like to tell you about Heart Butte is that it is a small town. There are no gas stations. There are no stores. There's only a church, a school, and a post office, and then the different neighborhoods that are there. As we arrived, we... Um, could see that a high level of poverty was apparent because we had homes that were very neglected and run down with broken glass windows that were boarded up. There was garbage all over in the yards, um, paper garbage, garbage of leftover appliances that they just tossed out on the side and old broken down cars. So I think for a lot of us that was a big eye opener here living in the United States that a place had so much poverty um, there were also a lot of animals running around the community too, as we have pets at our home that we take care of and have leashed up or put in our yard, their dogs roam free all over the community. Some of them had homes that they went back to at the end of the night, but most of them just wandered about and, and got food from people along the way and they were called the res dogs. Um, interesting little story as we went to pick up students for the um, kids club which you'll learn about in a little bit um, it was hard to drive down the road because not only were there the children running about but the dogs were all around the car too and you just didn't want to hit any of their animals so that was that was a very different thing than we're used to here um, some of those houses that I talked about looked like they would be condemned if they were here in Eau Claire um, and some of the kids had mentioned too that they looked, they were like haunted houses. Some of them actually weren't lived in. But one of the things as a mother I looked at was we were very remote. We were a long ways from anything if anything happened because the nearest town was about a 40 minute drive and there wasn't medical care for us at that town if we were to get hurt um, because they only served the natives. Um, our closest medical facility was over an hour away. So on the trip I prayed that nobody needed any medical care because we were pretty remote. But um, you'll be hearing some more about our trip. That was our first impression arriving, just mainly the, the high level of poverty. A reading from the Word of God. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he find, finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. Good morning. God's in peace to you. 
Waterfall. What comes to mind when you think of a waterfall? Fast running water, peace, beauty. I'm sure I could go on with many words to describe a waterfall. On Sunday, June 16th, before we checked into the reservation, we stopped at Glacier National Park. As Cody mentioned, it was am it's an amazing example of God's beauty, and I encourage everyone to visit. We went to Logan's Pass that is on the top and enjoyed all the snow with a snowball fight. It was getting to be about lunchtime, so we made our way down and found a beautiful area to have a picnic with the waterfall. It also was a great view of God's beauty. We enjoyed a picnic, lunch, and we're cleaning up. I was loading the van with Emma, and my dad and brother were loading the other van. When all of a sudden, Desiree, yes, Desiree, quiet reserve Desiree, came running and yelling, Hannah is in the water. At first I paused. For one, I wasn't sure what I heard. And for two, I've never seen Desiree run that fast or yell that loud. As soon as I heard it again, Hannah is in the water. I took off running. But first I had to ditch my bag and my Diet Coke to Emma, who was standing right next to me. It seemed like it was so far away, yet I was running as fast as I could. Time just slowed down. I felt like the whole world just stopped moving. My thoughts turned to prayers, asking God to hear our prayers. I arrived, feelings and emotions of being lost, helpless, broken, and afraid. All I could do was pray. A reading from the Word of God. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. You might be asking yourself, how does this relate to the theme pursued? I also asked my same, myself the same question. We all sin, and therefore we are all broken. And if we are broken, we may feel and think we are unworthy, unloved, unclaimed, unclean, unforgivable, and I could go on with the onwards. But this is not the whole story. God sees through our brokenness, through the onwards, and sees us as loved, clean, forgivable, and feels we are worthy, pursuing us with his love and grace. You may be in a dark, broken place, but God pursues us as we are desirable and worthy with his love and grace. As I was praying by the waterfall, a young couple with no hesitation helped. The guy was in the water pushing and holding Hannah up, and Eric and Aaron were holding her arms trying to pull, while the young woman was there holding their belts as anchors. I could see Hannah felt lost, helpless, and was broken. When she was out of the water, I remember thanking the couple and shaking their hands. I ran back with Alyssa to get towels and blankets. When I returned, the couple had already given Hannah a blanket, and I remember shaking their hands multiple times and thanking them. I only received the first name of the guy and that was Andy. They returned to their vehicle and drove up the mountain like they were just gone. Now at this point, Hannah was doing better and was in dry clothes, 
so I stayed back with her and Chad and the others as they went on a hike. During this time, I had to prepare myself for not only calling Hannah's mother, talking to Pastor Michael, but also relating all of this back to the parents. During the week of the reservation, I was always brought back to this event by either scripture or song, especially on Sunday night when we were singing, How Great Is Our God. It also was pretty amazing when I went back and checked on my cell phone that the first song that came up was, I Saw God Today. I would reflect during our week on how if we are lost, broken, or feel helpless or unworthy, God pursues us through love, through others, such as friends, family, or even strangers. I truly believe that God sent angels to save heaven, Hannah. I would like to leave you with this. If you feel lost, unworthy, helpless, or unloved, just remember that God forgives us of our sins and pursues us with his love and grace. Please turn to your worship outline. Under the section pursued, consider how, consider how God pursues us in love through others, sometimes total strangers. Now in the space provided, answer this. Today, who might you lift up with words of encouragement or with acts of love?
On Monday, we began our work with the Blackfeet tribe. We woke up early, ate breakfast, and did devotionals before being split into two groups. One group stayed at the school for kids club where we ate lunch, played games, sang songs, did crafts, and read with the neighborhood children. The other group drove about half an hour to the nearby by town of Browning where they repaired a large fence. This fence, which had been erected about eight years previously, surrounded a low-income housing area, which was home to 30 du duplexes. Over time, it had fallen into dis disrepair, worn down by the elements and perhaps some of the wild horses that roamed the surrounding fields. It needed to be restained, and a number of the boards had to be replaced. In a way, the fence was symbolic of our efforts on the trip. The fence itself could rep represent one's moral boundaries and its decline, of the decline the breaching of those limits. Repairing the fence symbolized how our experience there, experiences there forced us to restore our own boundaries and reaffirm our faith. A reading from the Word of God. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between the two sons. A few days later, the young son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in loose living. But when he came to himself and said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? And here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. The father said, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Even when the boundaries of our lives are broken, God is there, willing to love us, forgive us, and restore our relationship with him. While one group repaired the fence in Browning, the other worked at Kids Club. While we had a brief orientation session Monday morning, we weren't fully prepared for the tasks we faced that afternoon. In Blackfeet culture, it is not unusual for, chi for children, even very young ones, to be left alone for long periods of time. Consequently, the children were starved for attention and many of them sought it in negative ways. Many of the children were confrontational, inappropriate, and disrespectful. At my station, the reading corner, we had particular trouble with three boys in the group with the oldest children. They made a number of rude comments, threw books, and bullied some of the other children. We left Kids Club that day utterly exhausted and shocked at the behavior we had witnessed. On the fourth day, due to bad weather, some of us who had been scheduled to work on the fence were selected to return to help with Kids Club. We were astonished at how much the children's behavior had improved in just four days. When I returned to the reading corner, I saw four boys clustered around one of the members of the other ch church group, following along as he read from the storybook Bible. Twenty minutes passed before I realized that one of them was one of the boys who we'd struggled with so much. In just four days, his behavior had changed so dramatically that he was unrecognizable. A reading from God's word. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, despicable, hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This Spirit he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Having been saved and restored in our baptism through God's mercy, we are now called to sh shower others with the goodness and loving kindness of God. Please turn to your wo worship outline. Under the section Restored, write your answer to this question. What is keeping you from restoring others by showering them with God's goodness and loving kindness? Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to open our hearts and our minds as we transition to learning about how your love empowers us to do wonderful things. Please bless us 
and give us strength so that we may go out into the world and empower others with your love. Amen. this trip teach us about doing God's work, it taught us about each other. Some of these people I've known since elementary school, others I had just met, and some I have even known since they were born. No matter how long I have known them, our relationship is now a lot stronger. We bonded in several ways, starting with the van ride. As Cody said, our first day was a long 11 hours. Between sleeping on each other and telling stories, we grew stronger. When sharing meals in words such as pleasantly plump, we grew stronger. When working with kids or work projects, we grew stronger. Playing football, performing skits, and even listening to Cody and his bear stick helped us to grow stronger. This continued all week. We learned, learned more about each other as we learned facts and skills, such as how to use a mop and how many nails are in a pound. Throughout the week, we saw the best and worst of each other. Between little sleep and sickness, we endured a lot as a group. Um, I kept a journal throughout the week, and I looked through it and found an excerpt from Tuesday that said, I am proud to say I belong to the First Lutheran group here. Everyone is hardworking and respectful. I believe these relationships that became so tightly bonded on the trip will last forever. These are people I can talk with, laugh with, and cry with. We have shared memories, emotions, and inside jokes. I would go back to Logan Pass for another snowball fight any day, and I would want every single one of them with me. I left for Blackfeet Reservation with a cousin, brother, and mom. I came home with 21 family members that I wouldn't trade for anything. And um, Cody's favorite food is corn dogs.
A reading from the Word of God. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may, be, you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are chosen as God's own people to proclaim his mighty acts. Seems like a daunting task, doesn't it? Considering just how many acts we are to proclaim. During our week-long mission trip, uh, one of the easiest yet also most difficult opportunities to proclaim the good news was Kids Club. As Kai mentioned, the kids were at times unruly and quite a handful but they were so open to everything, everything we did, everything we said. Uh, they, they listened, they watched. They watched us, they, it, it was incredible how they responded to everything that we did. Kids Club empowered us to show God's love to the Blackfeet Nation. It empowered us to show them who Jesus is, and what he has done for us. And while not all of us may have the opportunity to attend a Youth Works mission trip and experience Kids Club, we can be empowered to do similar here in Eau Claire through the Great Commission found in the 28th chapter of Matthew. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded and know that I am with you always until the end of time. Amen. What an experience we shared during that time. I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you that supported us for all the breakfasts, the pastas, the silent auction, all of that. Thank you. Parents, thank you for allowing us to spend that time with your youth. It was an incredible experience, one that they'll have a whole lifetime. You can be proud, along with this congregation, of these kids. They were just great. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, the things that they did with patience and understanding in dealing with, I think Kaya put it as some unruly charges, is an understatement. They did great. They were, even when we took some wrong turns and had some interesting experiences, they hung in there, they stayed with it. I don't know, but if you've ever spent 11 hours in the back seat of a van and then be told, hey, guess what? We get to do it again tomorrow for nine hours. And the future's bright with the youth, and not just because of these 22 that went on the trip, but overall. But these that did go on the trip came away with something really special. So here we stand at the crossroads. Thus says the Lord, stand at the cross crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way lies and walk in it and find rest for your soul. My experience with Heart Butte actually began eight years ago. I was on a mission trip very similar to this. Uh, we had uh, worked with Youth Works and had went out to Heart Butte. So, when they began talking about this trip, I went, oh, please pick me, please, 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 please pick me. 
I didn't really have a tangible way to hang on to the back of the van and ride with. So I was definitely at a crossroads. I really wanted to go, and yet there was no real way for me to go. And uh, Chad and Amy approached me one day and asked if I really wanted to go. Oh my, of course I did. That's just tremendous, wonderful. The kids talked about all the experiences with the kids club, about a lot of gaps. Please ask them after service or sometime. There's a, just tons of stories. On Monday nights, there's a culture night and people from the community come in and one in particular gives a talk, Jolene, and she talks about the Blackfeet Nation she talks about the community, some of the history, everything that goes along with it. And along with that, there is uh, drumming and there's dancing involved and they actually teach us uh, some dancing. But uh, I think this year, it was a rain dance we performed because it rained a couple of days out there. Uh, but they uh, bring in young kids, still part of the um, community and we see them a week. Well, eight years ago when I was out there, I met a young person and she was eight years old at that time and she actually became an Indian princess. Her name is Christy. So before the trip, I was talking to my kids, Eric and Amy, and I said, oh, I wonder if, I wonder whatever happened to her. I wonder what she's like. Well, lo and behold, on Monday night, there she was. Now, I've not seen her in eight years. She's grown. She's a senior in high school. She's had an interesting life. She has an 18-month-old baby. But I recognized her. She's still just as beautiful as she was when she was eight. But like most of us, we're pretty shy, and we don't know how to just walk up to someone and start a conversation. So I wanted to make sure that I had the right Christy, and I did. And I walked up to her and I said, it's you, Christy, isn't it? And she just looked at me like anyone would when a 50-year-old man walks up to someone and starts having a conversation. But it was her, and we traded stories in that. About 20 minutes later, Amy did not know I had talked to her. Amy walked up to her. Because of how I had described her, Amy knew who she was. And she walked up to her and said, you're Christy. And Christy said, well, how do you know? And she goes, because my dad has told me about you. And I figured you would be about that age. Crossroads. Later on in the week, Thursday comes. It's a, we have, with YouthWorks, a community cookout. And I know, Michael, I'm sorry, I'm going long, sorry. We have a cookout, and all the community members come, and of that, Jolene comes. Now, the relationship with Jolene and Christy is, Jolene is Christy's grandmother. And I talked, to, I talked to Jolene, and I had told her that, as some of my confirmation students will tell you, I have told Jolene's story about her father and things. And Jolene was just in awe that someone would talk about her family and her culture in such a way. And that I remembered all about Heart Butte. So later on in the evening, we're having our worships worship service as we did every night, but th Thursday nights are very special nights with youth works. And all of a sudden I got a tap on my shoulder from one of the youth works staff, and he goes, Jolene wants to talk to you. Oh, well, I've already talked to her, I've already given her my address, she knows all, all that, maybe she forgot, maybe something. So I walked over to her and she said, where's your daughter and your son? I said, well, one moment, I'll get them. I thought that was pretty odd that she wanted to see all this. So 
come back with Amy and Eric, and she said, we have in our culture, normally it's a big ceremony that we have where we do this, but we know that you're busy in that. Um, but our family would like to adopt your family. Um, what that meant is they gave us each some beadwork, which is unique to their family. Um, we've got sweet grass, which is like an incense that we're to burn. We have sage, again, which is like an incense. And we have smudge that we're supposed to put uh, on us as we pray. Then the next highest honor that you can get as a non-native is to have an eagle feather. Not a bald eagle feather because I'm not native, but I have a golden eagle feather that is specifically for me. It's designed, it's given to warriors, but because they adopted us, the feather has been prayed for over that. It is my feather. No one else should touch it because the Spirit has blessed that feather for me. Now, what does all that have to do with crossroads? One never knows where God is to take you. One never knows the path you're to go. Just remember, God is always with you. God will lead you to where you need to be. God will always put you where you need to be. As I tell my students, there is a plan. God will never give up on you. We may give up on God, but God will never give up on you. You never know who you're going to affect and when. You'll never know whose life you're going to impact or when, or whose life is going to impact you. The trip was super important. I understand that now. Stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way lies and walk in it and find rest for your souls. So here we are at the crossroads. Doesn't matter how you feel, if you feel lost. Doesn't matter if you think you're undesirable. Doesn't matter if you're broken. Doesn't matter what you're wrestling with in your life. Could be a new job. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a relationship with God. Don't feel lost or broken or undesirable. Remember, God will not give up on you. You are that important. Remember, you are pursued. You are empowered. You are loved. Thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way lies and walk in it and find rest for your souls. Would you please rise as you are able? May the God who restores you from brokenness pursue you in love and by the Holy Spirit empower you to serve the lost, the lonely, and the last. Amen.
Please.